Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Colin Harper and Yaren Melarut of Hashrate Index to go over their mega 2022 report. In this show, we talk about machine prices, a state-by-state energy comparison, mergers, acquisitions, bankruptcies, and much more. Welcome back to The Mining Pod. I got two of my buddies on the show today. Listeners should be familiar with both their faces if you're watching on our YouTube channel. I got Colin Harper, former colleague and killing it over at Hashrate Index as the lead for their content team. And then Yaren Melarud, who's also a new analyst for them, previously at Arcane Research. He joined us back on the podcast, I believe in August, to talk about energy markets. They're both putting out this awesome new report on behalf of Hashrate index. We're going to dive into it. It's about 2022, uh, looking back at the data from last year. At the end, we'll get some thoughts from these two research bros on what they foresee in 2023. But welcome to the podcast, guys. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having us, Will. Yeah, thank you. Cool. So we got a lot of ground to cover. You guys told me that it was like 40 some pages beforehand. And no, we will not go over all 40 some pages. If anyone's interested, of course, go on the Hashrate Index website and subscribe to their email list and you'll get it into your inbox or just look for it on Twitter. Find both these guys on Twitter. Uh, so we'll leave that there. Let's talk about the highlights though. And before we do that, we'll give it to you guys for any like top thoughts while you guys have been working on this report for last month. Colin, I'll hand it to you first and then to you, Aaron. Yeah, so um, I guess high level thoughts for the report it ended up being a lot fatter than I thought it was going to be. A lot of that is thanks to having um, a boy Aaron over there helping out um, and adding some really good analysis and um, plucking some really good data. Um, I, I guess I would just say um, it's just, it has a much different tone than the report that I put out last year. Like when I put out the 2021 year, year end report, um, the industry was leaving the year on a high note you know, um, hash price, uh, hit an all time high in late October, early November, or sorry, a yearly high in early October or early November, late October of like 41 bucks per petahash. Um, and, um, you know, every metric was up, um, everything was just booming. And now obviously it's the exact opposite. Um, you know, we hit an all time low for hash price last year, $55 per petahash. ASIC prices are in the crapper. Um, you know, mining stock valuations are also in the crapper. It's just everything that we put into this report. Um, honestly, like the pressing is not the right word is because it's just where we are in the market cycle, but it was just, you know, everything was like, and this is down and this is down and this fell from this height in 2021. Um, so, you know, the report really kind of just looks at how brutal 2022 ended up being. And it kind of caps, uh, we cap it off with talking about how, you know, 2023 is going to be a real make it or break it year, um, especially considering 2021 brought in a lot of like pedestrian investors into Bitcoin mining um, with the Chinese mining ban, a lot of uh, business capital interest, you know, built up in North America. And a lot of people joined not really expecting what they were going to get themselves into. So 2023's mantra will be survival. And that's kind of like the takeaway or thesis of the report. Love it. Yaren, same question over to you. High level thoughts on the research report you guys are about to put out. Yeah, I, I would say the same thing as uh, Colin here. It's just been, uh, yeah, um, everything is going down this year, as you know. So, yeah, a little bit depressing uh, writing this report, but uh, good to put the attitude behind us and it gets our get the summer of the year down on the, on the paper and. Uh, after we have looked through that, we can look forward to 2023, which we believe will be a year of uh, of restructuring in the industry, and uh, and um, things can only get better from here, really. Mm. Or oh, I've heard that before, but I don't know if I believe it. Uh, really quick, before we dive into the subject we talked about before we recorded here, I do have a question. Just looking back versus the last bull cycle since 2017 2018 really saw the first time we saw industrial ASIC development. Of course, ASICs were around before that, but we actually had some publicly listed miners back then. We had miners at scale, so it's a good corollary if we want to pull one. How do you guys see 2022 versus 2018 in those two market cycles? Do you guys have any thoughts on that before we dive into our next subjects? This might be a cop-out, um, but I, I think, again, just at least from where I'm standing, and again, the reason I say this is a cop-out is because I'm 
I'm based in Tennessee. Like I'm really interested in the development of Bitcoin mining in the U S and in Canada and in North America at large. But I think that's really just the biggest difference for me is how much the industry is now concentrated in North America. Back in 2017, 2018, it was still China's game, you know, like 70, 80% of the hash rate, if not more was in China. Um, and now that script has been flipped. We've got about 45 to 50% of the hash rate in North America. Um, the other big thing too is the public miners. I think Marathon was public back then. I think Riot didn't make... So Marathon made the pivot to Bitcoin mining in 2017. I think Riot may have been 2018 that they made their pivot. But you know, back then it was just like basically those two guys, uh, those two companies, and then HUD8 came along. And the scale that they were working at back then was nothing, right, compared to what they are now. So I'd say those are probably two biggest things for me is, is the scope and scale of the public mining industry now um now it's you know north 20 percent of total hash rate and uh also just the fact that north america is the dominant player in the uh, bitcoin mining game currently yeah i can add the uh, add something there so in actually in 2018 uh, by the numbers the bear market was actually worse than uh, the current bear market uh if you look at the revenue per megawatt hour of electricity consumed it was like 20 30 percent lower at the bottom in 2018 than at the bottom in 2022 so by the numbers it was worse and it was probably feeling worse for most of the miners um but they didn't get that much attention exactly because at conventional there weren't a lot of public miners they at that time they made up way less than 10 percent of the hash rate probably probably even in the like five percent or less and now they make up like 20 percent so so uh, naturally this bear market gets much more coverage and also with the amount of like uh, re retail investors holding its public mining stocks who have been completely uh, crushed by the bear market so yeah that's a big uh, big uh, difference yeah, that's what I was sort of pulling on there. Appreciate both of your guys' answers. Uh, the comparison between like the cost per megawatt hour, hash price, those of things of that nature are just very interesting. But let's dive into the report itself and talk about some things you guys put some legwork into. We'll talk about S19 XPs, uh, the cost of power by state, looking at the energy mixes in those states, and then we'll move on to some global geography questions. Might sprinkle in a few public minor questions as well. We'll start with S19 XPs, however, Colin, boot it over to you. We've seen some interesting price dynamics with XPs, with XPs, excuse me, versus S19J Pros and other models. Uh, maybe walk that out for us and then tell me a little bit about what your research revealed. Yeah, so when the XP was announced in 20, um, gosh, wow, um, in uh, 2021, right? Yeah, I'm just, 20, 20 2020 has just been like three years, man. Uh, yeah. When they, um, I, I uh, played a trick on myself there. I thought it was 2020. Yeah. When they came out in November, 2021, you know, these things were priced at, um, if I recall correctly, you know, you could get an XP on futures orders for like 10 K or something like that. Um, it was, it was something in that ballpark. Um, and so obviously these were futures orders. They weren't going to be delivered until 2022 in July and August. Um, but in terms of uh, the, uh, when you compare that to, you know, the spot price of like an S19J Pro or another new gen rig, it was actually at a discount. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed this year, um, as mining economics have worsened, as margins have been getting crushed, and as X19, S19XP has actually hit the secondary market, um, we've noticed that the S19XP um, actually has commanded a premium uh, to other, uh, you know, new gen rigs like the S19J Pro um, in the spot market. Now, it's not totally surprising, right? Like in the same way that S19J Pro carries a premium in dollars per terahash to something like, a, you know, an S17, they were starting to see the same dynamic play out. And, um, you know, at the beginning of the year, I'm looking at the chart right now, um, or sorry, in um, August, on August 1st, uh, you could reliably find an S19 XP for about $60 per terahash, according to our rig index. Uh, and as we exited the year, that had dropped to uh, about $35 per terahash. Um, and uh, for a comparison, you know, an S19 J Pro might be $15 per terahash. 
Um, but one of the things that we notice, and this also makes sense as miners are trying to prioritize the highest efficiency and most powerful machinery um, on the market, we started to notice that the premium actually went up throughout the year. So um, at the beginning of, uh, at, at, uh, on, uh, in August, uh, which is when we have the earliest data for spot prices, um, because that's when they were finally hitting racks and being recirculated through the secondary market. Um, on August 1st, it was about a 41% premium X9, S19 XP to S19 J Pro and similar new gen hardware. At the end of the year, it was 57%. So we're really starting to see miners prioritize these rigs um, as, uh, you know, um, as margins continue to get crushed and there's not really an end at sight. Um, that being said, though, one last thing I want to add in here, we did like rig ROI analysis as well. And if you had purchased a S19 XP on August 20, on, in August 2022, August 1st, 2022, got that up and running on September 1st, um, uh, 2022, you would have ROI 33% of that machine. And your uh, days to ROI would be like over 518 plus days. We ran out of time on our model. So um, once we got to that 518, it just stopped at 33% ROI. So after 518 days, you would have a 33% ROI. Um, and if you had bought one on December 22nd um, and deployed it, you know, um, or sorry, December 2022, and you deployed it this month, you'd be about 21% ROI. Um, and we used like a forward projecting model for what hash price will be through 2023 to do that. But all that being said, uh, when you compare that to looking at ROIs for like an S19 J Pro, you would have ROI the S19 J Pro um, quicker on the December timeframe, but slower on the August timeframe. So you're paying a premium for this rig, obviously, because it's newer, it's more powerful, it's more efficient. But whether or not the dollars make sense, like whether or not it makes sense to deploy that capital that way right now, the premium might be too high. So miners might want to wait until there are more favorable prices for the XP. Yeah, it's crazy how much the volatility within ASIC prices changes the ROI period so quickly. And then obviously time on the rack is pretty important with rack space still being tough to get. Yaren, any thoughts on that before we move over to talk about state energy prices? Yeah, I would say that um, <clears throat> as Colin uh, just adds to what Colin said here, um, most miners, like the, the biggest fear of miners is to turn off machines and no miners want to turn off machines, especially miners don't want to buy machines and then get them and not be able to plug them in because of electricity prices. So with the hosting rates now, they have also uh, gone up quite a lot in 2022. So in a lot of uh, states and a lot of locations, uh, the only machine which can actually run profitably is the XP. And um, that explains the huge, uh, huge um, 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 extra pricing for that model. Yeah, one thing just to riff on the subject before we turn over, I want to get some thoughts from you guys. We have seen some mining firms not purchase XPs, and we have seen other companies purposely go after XPs pretty aggressively. So Riot and Marathon are the two I think of when I think about purchasing XP is like turning over their inventory very quickly. I think Marathon said in November, they plan on having their fleet about 66% XPs. And that's just based on efficiency. They're trying to get more yield for the Bitcoin. Other firms, however, are not doing that. Notably CleanSpark, which is actually not really purchasing XPs unless it really makes sense for them. They're pur purchasing SNTJ Pros and then finding different ways to overclock them or uh, increase their efficiency, either like dipping them in immersion or firmware, things of that nature. And they think that the CapEx spend is not worth it because the ROI period is then extended over a period of time. Do you guys have any thoughts on those two strategies? Because we're definitely seeing that sort of uh, come about in ASIC markets at this point. Yeah, I would say that Marathon's strategy since they went into Bitcoin mining has been to leverage their exceptional access to capital and the economies of scale in ASIC purposes. And of course, in that strategy, it makes sense to buy the XPs, even though they are more expensive. But CleanSpark is more like a smaller, more agile company, which is, uh, they don't have the access to capital like Marathon has, and that forces them to go into the market and trying to get good deals on different machines. 
Yeah, I liked uh, I like Clean Sparks um, strategy this bear market, right? Like they had two big acquisitions, Waha Technologies and um, Georgia, and then also of a Mawson facility that's also in Georgia. One of them's in Sandersville, and one of them is in Washington, Georgia. I can't remember which. Um, but basically, what you're doing there when you're buying those machines that are distressed, you're buying them at a discount to spot. Um, so you can get a better deal, even if they are used and they are, you know, new gen instead of next gen, next gen being S19 XP. And to Yaren's point, I think he's right about like Marathon, you know, Marathon is, is, is like the incumbent public miner. They were the first public company to pivot to Bitcoin mining because of that. They have a lot of brand name. They're included on a lot of funds, um, you know, a lot of indices and things like that. Um, and they just have a larger pool of capital to draw from because they have brand recognition right it's like classic first mover advantage so for them you know marathon really in 2021 and 2020 could just you know spray and pray with their orders i mean they put like what is it like 800 million dollars down originally on the on the xps in november and now they got some of that money back with the repricing but you know a lot of their strategy has been buy a crap ton of hash rate and, you know, investors don't really need to know whether or not you can energize that because they're not, they don't really understand Bitcoin mining well enough to have the sophistication to be like, well, do you actually have the megawatts allocated to this already? Um, so I, I would be inclined to say I'd rather, I'd rather be in clean sparks camp than marathons camp there. Cause eventually the piper is going to want to get paid. And if you don't have the money, then kind of shit out of luck. Yeah. And we can also see on the hash rate, the wars of 2022 most or yeah a lot of the public miners have uh, not reached their hash rate goals they have not even been close and the marathon is the perfect example of that they they uh, their hash rate goal was like 23.3 hash rate by the end of 2022 i think they have like 7x hash right now so correct me if i'm wrong but that's not not nearly their goal and in a clean spark, they're the only miner as I as I know that has actually beat their assured expectation for 2022 after these uh, acquisitions. Yeah, I know that's right. Uh, even I think the recent news was that Marathon was downgraded by Jeffries because it's not going to be able to get its goal by even mid 2023. Uh, did not expect the the hot takes on Marathon there, but let's move on to the next subject. Let's talk about state by state price and electricity. Uh, Colin, I'll throw this one again to you to explain what we're looking at. This came out, I think you guys had it in your quarter three report as well, and it was uh, a nice graphic that was floating around Twitter. A lot of people like this. So explain to me the graphic for those who are listening on the podcast and can't visually see it, and then what you guys sort of got out of the data. Last report, or I think this was like the uh, H1 report for 2022, we had a little neat graphic on cost of Bitcoin production per state. Um, we didn't revive that one this year or for this report for a number of reasons. Um, but one of the ones that we kind of replaced it with is we actually broke down the energy prices, uh, or well, we did energy price at average industrial price per state versus 2020, 2021, 2021 versus 2022. But we also did a breakdown of like the grid mixes of each state, um, which I had a lot of fun doing, um, that all that data is out there on EIA.gov. Um, highly recommend anyone who's interested in energy markets to look it up. It's fabulous data. Um, but that was really interesting because you can, once you break down the grid mixes of each state, you really get a better feel for why those states are more popular or less popular, right? Um, classic example of one that's becoming more popular is Washington for miners. They have some legislation and regulations that hamstring miners a little bit in certain jurisdictions, but they have like the lowest cost of industrial energy per, uh, megawatt hour of any state in the U.S. in 2022. And part of that is because of their uh, penetration of hydro energy. They're very rich in it. But uh, I'll, I'll kind of let uh, Yaren uh, take over here because he did a lot of work for the energy market section. Yeah, so uh, that the interesting uh, thing is that the Georgia has the biggest price increase in 2022 compared to 2021 in electricity. In 2022, the average electricity price in Georgia for industrial consumers was $92 per megawatt hour. That's up from only $65 per megawatt hour in 2021 on average. And it's interesting because Georgia is one of the most popular Bitcoin mining states. Most other Bitcoin mining states and the biggest states for Bitcoin mining also saw a huge increase in electricity prices. 
between uh, 25 and uh, 40 percent, both of them. And uh, yeah, as Colin mentioned, uh, one interesting uh, aspect of that is that uh, we provided a, a map which showing the average industrial rate in 2022 uh, versus 2021 in the US. And we can see that the states with a lot of hydropower, with a big penetration of hydropower, uh, they have the cheapest electricity right now. Uh, for example, Washington, they have the uh, cheapest in the US at $60 per megawatt hour. That's the average industrial rate in 2022. Oregon, electricity is also cheap there. And Idaho. And um, all these three states are rich in hydropower. So we run, run a correlation uh, correlation analysis, which showed that there's a significant negative correlation between a sta U.S. state's share of hydro in the electricity generation mix and their percentage increase in electricity prices in 2022. And uh, the reason for this is that there are mainly two ways to, to, um, uh, to uh, balance electricity grids. Uh, to adjust uh, the supply after the demand, you can either use uh, hydropower or you can use natural gas. And in those states which have a, which don't have hydropower, you are forced to use natural gas to kind of uh, uh, adjust the supply after the after the demand. So, and as you know, natural gas prices have increased dramatically this year due to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. And this natural gas price inflation spread from Europe to the US. And, um, and that means that the only states which haven't seen considerably increases in in electricity prices are those with little natural gas. And the only states which can have little natural gas is the one with a lot of hydro. And um, yeah. the hydro need to be stranded as well. So and one other thing to add to this too, um, some of the states that have some of the cheapest power are primarily run on coal. So one of the things that we've noticed, I mean, coal prices have uh, increased, but they haven't increased nearly as much as uh, natural gas. Um, so as Steve Barber would say, learn to coal. Um, it's been, it, that was one of the other things I thought was interesting, uh, plucking that out of the report. Um, Cause you know, um, coal gets demonized like a lot of, uh, you know, all the time by environmental activists and things like that. Um, but it's, it's proven to obviously be a very reliable base load for these states that rely on it. Yeah, the one thing that I look at when I see articles or graphics of this nature and when we compare prices across geographies is the political aspect, right? So maybe we can riff on that for a subject for a second. Uh, looking at Washington, Oregon, Idaho, there is some Bitcoin mining presence in these regions, but Washington State uh, for, for sure has had some issues with Bitcoin miners being in their presence. They've uh, on the local level, they've made moves to get them out. Uh, I don't know of anything on the state level, but they have definitely not been welcoming Bitcoin miners with open arms compared to, say, Texas. Um, curious if you guys have any thoughts on that, given their relationship with hydro in the Northeast and Bitcoin mining, uh, or even down in Texas or Georgia. Any thoughts on like how, more or less, does the energy incentive with cheap energy make it worthwhile with all like the political problems going on? Um. I can't really speak to regional context too well. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that uh, it, it it makes sense until it doesn't. You know, I think that New York is a good case study here. Uh, New York has a crap ton of hash rate, and you wouldn't expect it because of, like, you know, the fossil fuel moratorium that, um, that the state signed recently where they basically said, if you're running your mind on fossil fuels, you cannot do it. Um, there were, there, you know... Um, Places like Greenage and other operators were grandfathered in. If I were setting up a uh, mine in one of these like bluer states, I would probably think twice and, and only do it if I had really cheap energy and um, and it was like one of my only options. Because you know I don't think it's a secret to anyone that the unfortunately the Bitcoin mining um, discussion is kind of being. Uh, you know, parceled up and packaged almost as political talking points. It's really falling along party lines. I mean, there's a reason that the South and Texas have kind of, and parts of the Midwest have been leading the charge for um, Bitcoin mining in the U.S. And part of that reason is because they're more uh, business and private, uh, you know, um, 
you know, business friendly and uh, are more uh, geared towards the private sector. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I, I would, uh, I don't know. I would rather be operating in one of those states rather than a, a place that was like the Pacific Northwest or Northeast where I don't really know if they're going to just say, we can't accommodate these people and try to shut off the tap. Because we're seeing that happen in Canada too. Like Canada is getting absolutely... You know the mining industry there is getting absolutely stranglehold, uh, stranglehold by all of these regulations and legislations. Um, there are a bunch of moratoriums that were either proposed or levied in different parts of Canada last year. So, yeah, I can pick it up from there. Just a quick thought while you bring up Canada. Any thoughts on like the differences between Canadian provinces and U.S. states? Do you guys see any advantages in being in either one or the other? Uh, political stuff, notwithstanding, in terms of energy costs. Canada would be perfect if it weren't for the re regulatory environment because Canada produces more power per capita than any of the other G20 countries. Um, I mean, it's wild how much energy is produced in Canada. They've got, they're flush with hydro. Um, Alberta is super nat gas rich. Um, so, I mean, you know, all else being equal, if we took regulation out of it, you'd probably want to be in Canada, but you can't take it out, obviously, right? So I, I think that can Canada's... Uh, bureaucratic state has been uh, much more, you know, hardline and borderline, even, you know, some would say authoritarian in terms of how they've dealt with Bitcoin miners. That, uh, so that being said, I, I like the U.S. because of, of the, of, uh, you know, the state's rights structure, right? I actually think that banning mining in the U.S., like in China, would be incredibly difficult. Um, I think that states that uh, benefit from it, see tax revenue, job creation, things like that, would not let that happen and they would they would take that uh you know to the supreme court if there were ever anything serious like that proposed um and that being said too i think there are plenty of places in the u.s where you can find stranded or cheap enough energy to where that coupled with the regulatory environment just makes it better than canada overall and you know unfortunately we're seeing canada's share of hash rate drop i mean last year it peaked at 13 percent of the total network this year it dropped to about seven or eight percent um, so we're seeing actually those regulation in, in, in terms of where those industry participants are willing to set up shop. Cool. Well, let's move on to the next subject. We have two more on the docket. First, we're going to talk about uh, what you guys have titled pretty nicely. Basically, a fat hogs get slaughtered, acquisitions and bankruptcies within uh, 2020. And then let's finish up with a quick overview of different geographies. So you guys did that at the end of your report going through different places on the globe and how Bitcoin mining is growing in those different areas. So we'll start here. Yaren, I'm going to throw it to you. Let's talk about the maybe some acquisitions. Bankruptcies, of course, are sort of a highlight. Everyone wants to talk about it, but start it wherever you wish to. Yeah, so we can start by looking at the public miners. Uh, and it's interesting that we, if we look at the total market cap of the public miners between 2021 and 2022, it just shows how much this sector has been completely destroyed and um, in 2022. So at the peak of the bull market in 2021, the total market cap of the public miners stood at around $30 billion. Now it's below $3 billion. So it's like 90% reduced from the, from the peak. And we have seen most of the public miners and uh, the stock prices go down by like 90%. Um, and it's interesting because most investors have actually, if you bought them at the peak, you would have lost more than that because they have uh, they have also um, uh, raised a ton of capital and diluted their shareholders. So we've seen massive capital destruction in the public yeah, and mining space. And uh, we have also seen bankruptcies for scientific, um, um, Compute North, we um, we will see restructurings now. We are already starting to see it, and uh, it's going to be um, the biggest theme of 2023, uh, restructurings. We're going to see some mining companies go public, no, go private. We're also going to see, see a lot of them emerge. And the, the big driving forces behind that is that um, these companies have... Uh, huge uh, administrative uh, expenses because it costs a lot of money to be a public company. So 
if you have a market cap of like 30 million dollars, it doesn't really make sense to be listed on the NASDAQ. Um, and also their share prices have dropped below one, one dollar, uh, which is the listing requirement. So we'll uh, definitely see many of these companies go private and some of them merge and it's their administrative uh, expenses. Call any thoughts on any of that? No, not really. I think that kind of hits it. Um, I think in 2022, <laughs> it's just sad, huh? Yeah. I mean, it's brutal, right? <laughs> we saw, um, you know, one of the big themes for 2021 was like, uh, reverse mergers or, or, or SPACs, you know, like Corsi went public with a SPAC. Um, Griffin was supposed to go public with Sphere 3D. I don't think that happened. Um, at least I don't, I haven't seen anything about it. Um, uh, Stronghold was another IPO or an IPO that happened, I think this past year. Um, and there's one other that I, that, that fell through, oh, Prime Block. That never ended up happening. So you had all these companies interested in going public in 2021 and some of those plans came to fruition before the bear market and others crumbled in the bear market. And I think Aaron's right that you're just going to see a lot of these companies go private, maybe some mergers. Um, you'll see more distressed asset sales, like the ones with CompU North, um, selling, you know, all of its data centers getting divvied up between creditors. I think that'll be a really interesting thing to see pan out. You know, we saw Argo's Helios facility get sold to Galaxy for like 64 million um, right at the end of the year. Um, that's gonna that's the most interesting thing for me, I think, is seeing like these plug and play mining centers um, or rather turnkey mining centers just get just change hands, right? That, that's Those are the most coveted things, right? Um, so yeah, like you said, it's kind of sad, but I, you know, that, that's just what happens, man. Everyone, get, you know, gets ahead of their skis in the bull market. And a lot of these companies just threw around way too much money and got way too levered up. And there's no really way out for them except for bankruptcy or to restructure and sell some of those assets. Yeah, I feel like in a way, Bitcoin miners actually bought into the super cycle theory more than anyone else, just with the 100,000 coin uh, predictions. Unfortunate. Question back to you guys. Do you think this is going to be like a turning point for Bitcoin mining companies going public? They're going to look back on 2022 and say, we shouldn't do that. We should stay private or even for investors on the other side, right? They're not going to allocate capital. Firms and funds are not going to allocate capital to these things because they're so volatile and have a history of being volatile. I think that's going to be the a theme of 2023. I think it, most investors have been scared away from the Bitcoin mining sector or the crypto sector in general by uh, all the events in 2022 and the uh, reaching prices. Mm. But uh, I think the industry will uh, definitely see a resurgence, um, not in 2023, but maybe 2024 or 2025. And um, Mining companies will definitely go public again. It's a capital intensive industry that companies need to raise capital somehow. And it's a way for investors to get exposure to Bitcoin to the Bitcoin price. So I definitely think that mining companies will go public. Yeah. Not in uh, 2023. We will see a reduction in the public mining space in 2023. Yeah, I, I think that's the, I think that's about right. Um I, I think to Aaron's point, you're never going to stop these companies from going public, but hopefully 2021 and 2022 will serve as a kind of case study for what not to do. I mean, like the biggest, you know, um, the, the, the biggest fumble of the entire bull market was all of these companies holding Bitcoin at the all time high and then selling, you know, at like, you know, 30, 20, 16 K, um, all the way down. So I think that in the year and has this on the year end prediction for our report uh, for 2023 prediction is that treasury management is just going to become um, everything for some of these companies uh, because, you know, I, I don't know how, I don't know what else to say about it. It's just insane to me that some of these companies were holding tens to hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin at the peak and no one in their C-suite or the boardroom was like, guys, maybe we should shed some of this. I mean, you had bit farms go out and buy like 4k Bitcoin at, at $30,000. I, I mean, it's just insanity. So I, I would hope that lessons would be learned and they probably will because going back to one of your original questions, Will, the industry was not at the scope or scale in 2017 to 2018. All of the big miners were private miners in China. 
Um, and this was the first bull market where the public miners were kind of in the spotlight and everyone was looking at them. Um, and so I think that if we, you know, when we do get more pup miners going public, hopefully they'll look to this and realize what they should and shouldn't do. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, miners just did what the investors wanted them to do. So miners were, I- investors didn't know uh, how, or public investors, they didn't know how to like value Bitcoin mining stocks. They didn't know what was the real uh, value drivers of these companies. So I, I remember in late 2021, I saw like valuation models, that, for example, price holding was a common valuation metric, which showed a uh, like market cap divided by their Bitcoin stack. And that that was how retail investors valued these companies. So they could get a premium on the, the more, basically the more Bitcoin they held, the higher their valuation, the higher their future hash rate, the higher their valuation. And investors didn't understand how difficult it is to plug in, plug in hash rates. So that that's the, that's the main thing. Uh, investors can learn from this. They can learn that it's hard to expand the Bitcoin mining operation and just ho- holding Bitcoin is not necessarily the, the best uh, thing you can do. So I think these companies will still go public, but uh, hopefully investors will have learned enough to to like uh, to uh, uh, demand demand some more sophisticated the risk management from these companies. Yeah, I'll be holding my breath waiting for that. We'll see if it happens. Let's go to the last subject for today. Let's talk about the geographic dispersion of miners. You guys include a fi- five different sections, I think, or maybe six. Europe, Latin America, Russia, Kazakhstan, Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. Let's just do a quick survey of this. You guys can pick your favorite places to talk about Yaren, I'll throw it to you first. Uh, obviously, we've seen Bitcoin mining grow all over the globe, the United States and Canada taking a large chunk of it since the mining ban in China. But I think these stories are really going to be the most interesting during a bear market, such as with Gridless in Africa, uh, or maybe some more mining underground in China. But I'll throw it to you, Yaren, for your picks. Yeah, I could uh, start with Europe because I am from Europe. And uh... Europe is interesting because it has been the center and the source of this energy crisis. So miners in Europe have really been cornered into northern Norway, northern Sweden and Iceland. So in the far north of the continent. And that's the only places where the electricity is cheap enough to run the mining operation. So in Europe, we have an interesting situation where electricity prices are like between 200 and 300 dollars per megawatt hour in continental Europe, like Germany, France. And they are how the average price in Northern Norway has been like $18 per megawatt hour in 2022. So we have huge price differences between these regions. And that's because Northern Norway, Northern Sweden and Iceland has uh, stranded hydropower. And Iceland has also drew a lot of geothermal power. Um, there were a lot of mining capacity in southern Norway and southern Sweden, but this uh, they have been forced to move up north. The prices have increased in these areas. Um, and uh, the same thing uh, has happened in Canada, happens in Europe too. The governments don't really like Bitcoin mining here. So, for example, in Norway, they have uh, recently increased the uh, power tax for all data centers. Now they have to pay like seventeen, uh, no, yeah, seventeen dollars uh, per megawatt hour in power tax, so that will effectively double their all in electricity prices. So I think we will see that in twenty twenty three as well that governments in Europe are going to be increasing the hostile uh, towards uh, Bitcoin miners. Um, so we will likely not see a huge growth in Europe in uh, in 2023. I can also just uh, quickly go through Russia and Kazakhstan, which I also looked into. In the end of 2021 or beginning of 2022, Kazakhstan was the, yeah, it, it had like 18% or something like that, look, the hash rate, a huge proportion of the hash rate. 
Uh, now they have like you know, you know, less than 5%. And that's because of the government in Kazakhstan. The government uh, or the political risk in Kazakhstan has, re has uh, really um, owned itself. So Kazakhstan miners have been uh, through uh, a variety of obstacles, including electricity rationing, internet shutdowns, increased power taxes, and also new and ever changing reporting requirements, license requirements, and more. So you understand that the bureaucracy of mining Bitcoin in Kazakhstan is, is really intense. Uh, but uh, in Russia, the Bitcoin mining industry is it's growing really fast. And that's uh, partly because Russia has a lot of stranded natural gas. Russian miners have been located in Siberia for a long time where they utilize stranded hydropower. But uh, uh, recently, miners have also started to set up operation on, in Western Russia, where they have a lot of stranded natural gas that can't get to Europe. Uh, so um, the Russian government is actually encouraging citizens and businesses to use more natural gas complete opposite to the euro they actually have too much natural gas so of course uh, miners will take advantage of that and set up operations there so and the russian government also um, estimated that the um, miners in the country consume around 1.7 gigawatts of uh, energy right now so it's been a huge increase in 2022 for Russia, and uh, it's likely going to increase in, in 2023 as well. Colin, going to kick it to you for your sections. Any uh, surveys or thoughts about global Bitcoin mining? So I would say the two the two regions, well, there are three regions that I'll talk about um, for different reasons. First one being Latin America. Um, Luxor is expanding uh, our footprint in Latin America. We've got quite a few Paraguayan um partners at this point um also in other parts of the region uh like uruguay argentina and places like that um it's become uh latin america has become a kind of a uh, as as north america's mining industry has grown latin america has kind of fed off of this growth um a lot of miners from china who migrated to this hemisphere um the uh, western hemisphere have taken interest in the region uh primarily because the electricity is so cheap. I mean, it's cheaper still than North American electricity, um, you know, for a number of reasons. There are fewer people consuming it uh, per capita. Um, and also, it's just a cheaper region of the world. So you can get, you know, pretty good deals on power down there. Um, but there are still um, some plenty of, there are plenty of things that are hamstringing um, growth in Latin America. Um, perhaps the biggest uh, is just general political and social um, stability. You know, um, Venezuela has been a huge Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin region in Latin America, you know, uh, relative to the rest of the uh, rest of the region for a while. And, um, you know, sometimes miners who come from other jurisdictions are interested in Venezuela. Um, but to actually operate in a place like that, um, you know, Venezuela experiencing still rampant hyperinflation, it's 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 more or less a state run by the cartels um, at this point. You really need to have someone that you know in the area to shepherd you to make sure that you're not going to get into some areas or, you know, infringe on someone's turf, so to speak, um, not get your head blown off um, and just make sure that you're uh, navigating the social and political environment well. Um, the other thing about uh, just in general with Latin America, just kind of to that point, you know, to really get your rigs into some of these places, the local officials aren't stupid. They know what you're importing. If you lie to them and say that it's something else, they're going to seize your equipment. Uh, we've already seen places like Argentina um, and, um, you know, in Venezuela as well, bust quote unquote illegal crypto uh, mining operations, uh, unregistered ones. So um, just kind of the TLDR for Latin America, a lot of promise in the industry, but um, there's going to there's going to need to be some sort of clarity on a regulatory and political um, basis and and in some places some there's going to be need you need to be some social stability for more miners to go over there a uh, kind of last point on this for latin america some places like paraguay we're trying to make efforts to regulate the industry and create um 
you know, basically create uh, tax caps for Bitcoin miners in terms of um, how much they could be taxed per unit of uh, power draw. That fell through in Paraguay recently. The uh, president did not sign the bill and the lower house or the president vetoed the bill and the lower house did not ratify it. Um, so that was kind of a big setback uh, for we had to kind of high hopes for seeing that kind of legislation creates uncertainty in Paraguay. And, and that did not happen this year. Um, moving on to um, Asia, you know, a lot of people thought that uh, China's mining ban would be the death knell for China's Bitcoin mining industry. Obviously, that's not the case. This stat has been circulated a lot, but, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of the global hash rate resides in China still. Um, a lot of uh, Chinese mining companies uh, and miners are very well connected at this point. That's how they're still able to operate. Um, some of our China, uh, our team in China on the brokerage side of things thinks that you'll see hash rate either plateau or maybe even decline a little bit in China over the next year. Um, but they don't really see the foresee the government really trying to crack down any more than they already had have on um, on Bitcoin mining. Um, besides that, um, just briefly going to jump over to uh, to Africa really quickly. This is kind of a dark horse uh, in in the global hash race. There's not very much hash rate in, in in Africa right now. I mean, on the global scale, it's a percentage point. Um, don't you know? Like, don't hold me to that because I actually don't know it precisely. But you know, it's it's very little um, compared to the rest of the world. Obviously, people on Twitter went nuts for the hydro mine in Kenya, um, gridless uh, compute raised two million dollars, partly from Jack Dorsey's block to help build that out. Um, a lot of kind of micro facilities like that, like the biggest one that some of our partners knew of was a five megawatt facility in the Congo. Um, you know, big for some people, not very big in the grand scheme of things. But that being said, Africa has a lot of promise. Um, there is a lot of hydropower in Africa that is underutilized because just generally speaking, African countries don't have um, as, as much in the way of utilities or infrastructure. But just to kind of give you an idea, like Ethiopia, for instance, produces like 4,000 megawatts, according to a 2021 survey um, of hydropower. Angola is a is a country that we see a lot of um, Chinese miners actually taking interest in, and it also produces just shy of 4,000 megawatts from hydropower. So a lot of untapped potential in Africa, and I think that it'll be one of those, um, I think it'll be a continent that we hear more about, uh, especially from Chinese miners. You know, um, Chinese industries and government have had an increasing interest in Africa. You know, there's this kind of like neo-colonialism going on over there where China will fund you know, I extend a loan to a, to a country for infrastructure, they default on the loan, and then now China owns a new port in Uganda, right? So like that's been a pretty pretty big theme for the latter half of 20, uh, 20, the 2010s. And I think that as you see more investment dollars getting poured from Chinese industries and government into Africa, I, to me, it just makes sense that some of those dollars would come from miners looking to build up in the region. Love it. Thanks for the survey, guys. Everyone who's listening to this, make sure to check out the hash rate index report that's coming out this coming Wednesday, the day this pod podcast is coming out, actually. So if you're listening, go ahead and check that out. As we close out, we got to do it. It's the hash rate projection for 2023. We always do this and it's the beginning of the year. So you know, wipe out what happened last year. I'm pretty sure Colin was wrong by like 50% last year. Uh, what do you guys think? Is going to happen Wait, hang for 2023. I'm going to fact check. My my prediction for an article that wrote for Hash Rate Index was nearly spot on. I just want to say wow. it was 255, okay. and I think we were at. Well, we were actually under that because of the cold snap. So yeah. this kind of goes into like, oh, well, very cold serious. snap didn't happen. Then would it have? You know, would you have been right? But <laughs> yeah, actually, my prediction was 255, man, and on December 31st. Seven day average was two fifty five. So, well, gotta defend my record. Well, there we go. Okay, let's see if you can do it again. What, what's your projection for twenty twenty three? Oh shoot, man. Um, projections are a fool's game, but I'm gonna make one anyway. Um, hash rate increased by forty one percent this year. What are we at right now? We're at two sixty eight. Um. I'll go ahead and take 310. 310. Kids in the books. I think it's going to be, yeah, I think it's it's going to be, I mean, a lot of people probably think this too, but like 
you know, people's projections in the bull market were just crazy. They were like, we're well, three yeah. fifty extra hash by the end of the year. And I think that, you know, maybe I'm taking the bearish, uh, a little more of a bearish case scenario here, but I don't think it's going to grow very much this next year. Uh, the miners are going to have a lot of headwinds facing them. So I'll take 310. Aaron? I think uh, 320. I think we will see 20% ex, uh, growth in the X ashes in 2023. Okay. It's on the books 310 and 320. Thank you both for joining the mining pod. We will see both of you guys again soon. Of course, reach out to Hash Rate Index. You can find their uh, newsletter on their website. You can find both these guys on Twitter. We'll have their links in the bio. And then also check out the report, which will be in today's show notes. Thanks, Colin. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate you talking to you week, bro.